Hey, hey, hey. All right, so this video is going to be more of like a podcasty type of video. So I'm not really going to be putting any images on screen or anything. I'm going to just have some X gameplay in the background. So feel free to just listen while you play some Xenoblade. Like, shit, why not? But, um, yeah, if you're not able to watch, you're not missing anything. So just feel free to listen. But, uh, by the title, y'all can see a pretty goddamn hype on Xenoblade 3. Like, extremely hype. I know everyone says, oh, you don't understand how hype I am. You don't understand how much this means, how excited I am with you, with you. No, fuck them, okay? I'm the one who's excited. I am hype about this game. Everyone can say they're hype, but no, that doesn't matter. I'm hype. Like, what? Ah! Xenoblade 3 means like so much this is like huge okay this means so much to me and the game's not even out yet and there's many 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 reasons but um one of the reasons why i'm so excited for this game is because modelist soft you know takahash brown and modelist soft are going all out on this shit bro like they're going all out on Xenoblade 3. I like Xenoblade 2. See, Xenoblade 2, it's, you know, the best game ever. Okay, so it's like the best game of all time, so it's already perfect. But it would have been even more perfect if it just had a little bit more, you know, time. Uh, Xenoblade 2 suffered from a lot of time constraints. So, you know, they weren't able to make the absolute best game possible like they wanted to. And a lot of, there, there was like a lot of post-release updates for Xenoblade 2. This time, with Xenoblade 3, not only is it going to be better because of timer, because, you know, more time, but also because of the technology. Monolith Soft had a hell of a lot more time to make Xenoblade 3 than they did with Xenoblade 2. And not only that, they have more technology, better equipment. They're able to put more money into it. They have more employees now. Like, y'all don't understand, like, how goaded Monolith Soft is right now. Monolith Soft was relatively unknown, you know, when um, Xenoblade 3 or 2 was coming out. Uh, they really, like, when when, when uh, Nintendo bought them out, that's when they really started to shine. Like, every game monolith soft makes is an absolute fucking banger okay xenoblade one was wasn't really didn't really do as well as like xenoblade two because first xenoblade one came out on the wii in like 2010 at like the very end of its lifespan so not even that it wasn't even originally supposed to be released in the u.s until operation rainfall which you know got it localized and released so we got that in 2010 like right at the end of the uh not switch Wii's lifespan so it wasn't really well known but like xenoblade 2 got that switch treatment you know the switch treatment like it's weird like every game that comes to comes to the switch does numbers every game that comes to the switch whether it be an indie title triple a just sells a hell of a lot so like since Xenoblade 2, Monolith has been doing pretty well, and yeah, they helped work on Breath of the Wild, Splatoon 2, Animal Crossing New Horizons. All of those are, you know, in the list of, you know, top selling Switch games. All of those games did absolutely great, and they're like all getting sequels now. Maybe not in New Horizons, but you know what I mean. Breath of the Wild is getting a sequel. Okay, Splatoon 2 is getting a sequel that's coming out in literally September. You know, Blade 2 is getting a sequel. <laughs> okay, like, Monolith Soft is doing well now. So, like, Monolith is doing the best now than they've ever had. Xenoblade is at its, you know, biggest and most popular than ever has before. So this is, like, the perfect time to, you know... For Xenoblade to blow up. Like, Xenoblade 3 is definitely going to be the best-selling game in the entire 
and you know, it's gonna be the best selling Xenoblade game. Mainly because Switch treatment, again, but also because the growing popularity of Xenoblade. Xenoblade is at its height right now, it's at its most popular and well known now than it has ever been before. So it's going to sell pretty well. Xenoblade 2 sold like 2.05 million copies as of like, I think last year, I don't remember. But um, I really hope Xenoblade 3 hits 3 million copies. And by the way things are looking, it looks like it's going to. Now, the special edition, that would have helped, you know, the special edition, if, you know, everything went accordingly, that would have greatly helped. So, I mean, hopefully this next time, you know, the next time they run the pre-orders for the special edition, hopefully that goes a lot smoother. I really want me one. I'm copying me one, okay? I will get one. I, oh, I want this shit so bad. But, um, yeah, Xenoblade is, like, at its peak right now. Ever since Monolith has been bought out by Nintendo, Monolith has become the most important subsidiary to Nintendo. And like, Nintendo is doing very, very well because of Monolith, so they owe a lot to these motherfuckers, okay? And another reason is because, and actually before I get to that, I think Xenoblade 3 is like going to be the definitive like Xeno game because Takahashi finally is able to like fulfill his vision for not just Xenoblade but all of Xeno he's finally being able to tell the story that he wanted to tell for like over 20 years now the full story and it may be confused but for those of you who don't know or those of you who just need a refresher I'm gonna have to explain like perfect works you know the timeline and how Xenoblade 3 fits all into that now I have a video that goes more in depth about how Xenoblade 3 is episode 6 of perfect works but I'm gonna just as like a little refresher just skim through it right real quick so perfect works is essentially an art book for Xenogears and within that art book there's like a two page two pages it's like this huge timeline this really big timeline for the story of Xenogears the Xenogears was supposed to be part five to a six part story and naturally they're going to be six games to tell all six parts now the fucked up thing is Squaresoft under at this time uh Takahash Brown, Takahashi was working under Squaresoft and you know so we made Xenogears. Squaresoft went up to Takahashi and there was like, hey yo, if this sells one million copies, then we'll give you the green light to go ahead and make another Xenogears. The fucked up thing is, Xenogears only sold like 900,000 copies. Okay, just think of that for a second. You don't know how... If I was Takahashi, I'd be so pissed by that shit, bruh. If only a hundred thousand more people had bought the game, Xeno could be completely different from what we know today. We could have had all six Xeno Gears games, and that's it. There would be no Saga or Blade. The only reason Saga and Blade exist is because Xeno Gears failed. So just imagine if a hundred thousand more people bought Xeno Gears. Xeno would be completely different right now and I might not even make it I might not even be making this video right now. My channel may not even be what it is. <laughs> okay. But um yeah. Uh it sold nine hundred thousand when Squaresoft said if it sells a mill, then they'll make another. You know, Takahashi, he wasn't having that. He was like, man, fuck y'all, I'll make my own game. So he split from Squaresoft and founded his own company, Monolithsoft. And Takahashi still wanting to tell this story and for clarity perfect works is the name of the art book not the timeline but we just call it perfect works for like brevity's sake and clarity's sake so whenever you hear someone say perfect works they're referring to the timeline that is within the art book perfect work it's just much easier to call it perfect works than you know the Xenogears timeline but 
Takahashi still wanted to tell the story of Perfect Works, so he started a brand new series called Xenosaga. And just like Xenogears, Xenosaga was supposed to be a six part story, you know, six games to tell the whole Perfect Works story. Now, obviously, the Xenosaga version of Perfect Works is. The story of Xenosaga takes themes and references from Perfect Works. It's kind of like a retelling of the Perfect Works story. It's not exactly what it was going to be in Xenogears. He just took that and like flipped it in its own way. So basically the base, like the base story is still there, but the way it was told was different. So obviously as we know Xenosaga only sold three games because it sold less and less with each release and I actually think I know why so Xenosaga 1 it did okay and then Xenosaga 2 did really bad because we all know why okay it's Xenosaga 2 do I need to say anything else about that and then the reason I think Xenosaga 3 sold the least is because after what everyone saw with Xenosaga 2, maybe people were afraid that Xenosaga 3 was going to be like Xenosaga 2 and they just didn't even bother, you know, buying it. And now, like years later, we know motherfuckers should have bought Xenosaga 3 because that it's the best game out of the three. And now it has the least amount of copies printed, which means it's very rare to find and very expensive. Trust me, I know, I dropped like $250 on, his, on Xenosaga 3. <laughs> This shit is that cheap. But um yeah, Xenosaga 3 or Xenosaga was supposed to be six parts. And you know, they're gonna tell the perfect work story throughout those six parts. However, Xenosaga 1, 2, and 3 were only really able to tell like episode one and two of Perfect Works. So Xenosaga 1, 2, and 3 take place in like episode one and two of Perfect Works. And then after that failed before I get to that, when Monolith Soft was founded, they were bought out by Bandai Namco, and that's when they made Xenosaga. After Xenosaga failed, Nintendo bought out Monolith Soft, and kind of as a morale booster from the failure of Xenosaga, uh, Monolith Soft or Takahashi decided, hey, let's make a brand new game, okay? And it's like, that has nothing to do with Xeno, just a brand new game as a morale booster. And then while they're working on the game, the absolute legend, okay, the goaded legend, goaded ass legend, Sotaro Iwata, he came up to Takahashi and he was like, Ayo, 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 Takahash Brown, why not name this game Xeno? Like, make this a Xeno game, name it Xenoblade. And his reasoning for that was basically to just honor the legacy of Modelist Soft in Takahashi, as well as, you know, just the legacy of Xeno and to like honor Gears and Saga and Takashi was like yeah okay and this game originally as we know was called Monado Beginning of the World now it is known as Xenoblade Chronicles as we know it now and Monado Beginning of the World had to be reworked a little in order to fit into you know Xeno had to be retrofitted or refitted into the form of a Xeno game so Takahashi not wanting this Xeno game to fail and he still wanted to tell his full six part story of Perfect Works. He decided to fit the entire Perfect Works story minus episode six into Xenoblade 1. Okay, and Xenoblade 1 did relatively well. And then they said, okay, Xenoblade 1 did all right. Let's, you know, make another one. And then they made Xenoblade X and Xenoblade X Xenoblade X is always the outlier. It's so weird. Um, I don't really know how it fits into Perfect Works, I think. I think. Okay, episode one is about like an interstellar war, interplanetary war. And in the opening of Xenosaga or Xenoblade X, we see the war between the aliens and I think the Samarians. Or that might have been the game. Yeah, I think it's the aliens and the Samarians. No, not the aliens, the ghosts. The ghosts? and the Samarians and yeah so I think Xenoblade X I'm not really sure where it fits into the timeline I just know episode one is that cutscene of you know the interplanetary war above earth before it was 
exploded. And then Life on a New Planet, that's episode two. So that's when they land on Mira. And then I forgot what episode three is. I think that's a tragic villain's origin, which we don't have yet for Xenoblade X. So I think Xenoblade X tells is, you know, retelling of episode one and two because Life on a New Planet is episode two and we had just arrived on Mira and still adjusting. So he, I don't really know what his thought process was with like Perfect Works and Xenoblade X because we, you only have episode one and two of Xenoblade X. But then again, Xenoblade X is going to get a sequel. First of all, because why would he only tell episode one and two for Xenoblade X? And then there's like two massive ass cliffhangers at the end of Xenoblade X. And then even more. In an interview, Takahashi said that he actually, like, he said this himself. He said, this was like a couple years ago, he said he wanted to make a Xenoblade 3, a Xenoblade X2, and then a brand new IP, in like, in that order. I don't remember ex specifically what interview it was. Um, I'll probably find that later and put it in the description, the link to it in the description. But he said he wanted to work on a Xenoblade 3, X2, and then a brand new IP. So, hey, we already got Xenoblade 3. So the next big like monolith game or Xeno game is gonna be an X2, okay? So let's keep our fingers crossed that we actually get an X2. But um, yeah, so I guess like Takahashi wanted to tell the entire perfect work story inside Xenoblade 1 and part of it in X because he didn't, you know, he didn't want Xenoblade to fail like Gears and Saga did. So this was kind of like a safeguard for that. And then he saw Xenoblade 1 and X did pretty well. X, I think, sold the worst out of 1, X, and 2 because, you know, it was on the Wii U. So it was bound to die anyway. I loved the Wii U, okay? And I'm pretty sure I'm like the only one who did. No one else likes the Wii U. Everyone hates it. So like X was doomed to fail from the beginning. But then, you know, Nintendo Switch came out, brand new system, a lot more powerful than the Wii U, and you know, it's doing pretty damn well. So, you know, Monolith was like, hey, let's make Xenoblade 2 a brand new Xenoblade game for this Switch. And now we all know Xenoblade 2 is the best selling in the whole series, thanks to the Switch treatment. And again, he told the entirety of episode 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 all into Xenoblade 2. Again, I'm guessing as like a safeguard in case Xenoblade failed, he was able to tell the full story. But if you think about it, that's not the full story. Episode 6 is still missing. In Perfect Works, in the book, uh, there's like a description of each episode. There's like very detailed description of each episode. And um, episode 1 is Interplanetary War. Episode 2 is Life on a New Planet. Episode 3 is... I don't remember. I think that's a tragic villain's origin. Episode five, 4 is... I don't remember what episode 4 or 5 is. But episode 5 is when Xenogears took place. But like, yeah, like I said, there's I have a video. I'm gonna have it in the end card and maybe in the I card and I'll have it in the description of how Xenoblade 3 is episode 6 and I go into detail of how Xenoblade 1 and 2 and even X like all fit into perfect works and like which parts of the story of Xenoblade 1 and 2 fit into which episode in perfect works so it all lines up and so basically you know we still have yet to have uh, episode 3 there's no ep or episode 6 there's no episode 6 in any of the Xeno games and that's weird because we don't really know much about episode 6. Like even in the in the Perfect Works book, there's really nothing on episode 6 except for the episode 6 is basically fighting to stop the end of the universe, the party, you know, the protagonists for whatever game it would be are fighting to, you know, basically keep the universe together from collapsing. Now, I think that Xenoblade 3 is the episode 6 that Takahashi has been wanting to tell for over like 20 years, okay? 
episode six xenoblade three is the episode six and there's many there's a lot of evidence to support that now yes the game is not out yet but from what we do know it's possible that or there's like there's no other way that it can't be that episode six is xenoblade three and i you know i again i keep saying this but i explain all of this in that video i really want you to go watch that video okay so y'all know what i'm talking about but as a brief kind of like a brief um overview of the little theory i guess xenoblade 3 is episode 6 so episode 6 is the fight to keep the universe from collapsing and basically destroying itself and xenoblade 3 that's exactly what the party is doing now the reason that the universe is collapsing you're gonna need some xenosaga knowledge in order to understand this and it might sound weird but yes all the xeno games are like connected i mean obviously they're all in the same meta series but a lot of the themes and everything going on in xenosaga and gears or xenosaga and blade are from gears so they're all like they're all connected anyway but essentially in xenosaga there's a thing called upper domain and the lower domain the lower domain is basically our plane of ex existence and everything as we know it and then the upper domain in xenosaga is where uru uh, resides uru is a wave existence and can be seen as some sort of god okay uru is looked at as a god and is is believed to be the cause of the gnosis and each lower domain has an upper domain and in the lower domain there's this little separate like subdomain called the collective unconscious and whenever you die your spirit basically um joins the collective unconscious and this is like basically what's keeping the whole universe intact and the universe contains you know the upper and the lower domain so if one domain is destroyed the other domain is destroyed and therefore the entire universe is destroyed but if someone's consciousness or spirit soul whatever you want to call it if they reject you know unifying into the collective unconscious then that's what creates a gnosis so every time a spirit or a soul rejects unifying they become a gnosis and every time a gnosis is created the collective unconscious gets weaker and weaker and the weaker it gets eventually the collective unconscious will be destroyed therefore destroying the lower domain therefore destroying the upper domain therefore destroying the entire universe so and we kind of have like conf not really confirmation but gnosis exists in xenoblade now this is spoil i don't really know if it's spoilers but if you don't want to be spoiled on anything leave like right the hell now because <laughs> this may be spoilers i don't know but i'm gonna just say spoilers just to be safe but now is your chance to leave if you don't want spoilers for xenoblade one so more so future connected but in future connected the fog king the fog king is um takes a lot of he's very similar to gnosis so gnosis reside in i forgot to mention this okay in the lower domain okay i know it's a lot but i'll probably put up a die i know i said it wouldn't but i'll probably just put up a diagram of this upper and lower domain thing so it's easier for y'all to understand but the lower domain has two separate little domains the imaginary number domain and the real number domain so the real number domain is you know where we reside in everything and you know everything as we know and then the imaginary number domain is where the collective unconscious and gnosis reside so the gnosis are in like their own separate plane of existence so you know we can't really we can see them but we can't really like touch them or hurt them like we can't make contact with them but they can still like touch and make contact with us it makes no sense but 
essentially the fog beast and future connected is essentially the same thing uh, he resides in his own plane of existence and can't really be hurt and the only way to bring the gnosis into the real number domain for us to actually you know make contact with them and hurt them is by something called the hilbert effect and you may know that cosmos has the hilbert effect and in xenosaga cosmos uses the hilbert effect to bring to basically like merge the two real number and the imaginary number domain and bring the gnosis into the real number domain and shulk kind of makes his like own little makeshift hilbert effect in future connected and he uses that to bring the fog king into you know the xenoblade version of you know the real number domain and he's able you know they're able to fight him and defeat him there so and takahashi himself said that future connected is you know the future of xenoblade itself so if that's true then we will see black fog beast aka gnosis in xenoblade 3 and from what we know you know episode 6 the weakening of the universe and keeping the universe from destroying itself and being destroyed the more gnosis that are created the weaker the collective unconscious gets and once that goes the lower domain goes the upper domain goes and the whole universe is gone so in xenoblade 3 the flute playing when basically the sears like when neo and noah you know play their flutes and we see all those white particles and they say that playing the flutes like is a way of mourning the death of those who fell in battle right and basically when they turn into those like white particles and just like float away that's basically like resting the spirit and helping them find their way to the collective unconscious so you know the fog king exists so it was essentially a gnosis who's to say that there are more gnosis so in the events of xenoblade 3 the reason we have to keep the clocks full is because actually before i get to that you know playing the flutes returns the souls to the collective unconscious and keeping clocks full is basically a way of keeping ourselves alive since the collective unconscious is weakening and more gnosis are being created there's like less ether in the world and the weaker the collective unconscious gets the weaker the lower domain gets so we kind of have to keep the clocks full to keep ourselves alive because it's getting harder to live and once our clocks run out you know we die and then either go to the collective unconscious and reject it or unify with it so the party and then basically i'm sure all of ionia's and they're like the end of the game will all they're basically all fighting to keep the um collective unconscious together the seers are trying their hardest to help all of these souls unify with the collective unconscious and somehow figure out a way to keep it together and you know find some way to stop souls from um you know stop the souls what, what the hell is the word i'm looking for stop the souls from rejecting stop them from rejecting the collective unconscious now i could go deeper into it i already kind of explained the whole thing but again go watch that video it'll be there's it'll be in the end card and in the description go watch that i explain it so much better in that video i kind of just like went off of memory from but it's more organized over there or well, maybe not i don't know i made that video like a month or two ago but if you couldn't tell i get like really fucking passionate about zero blade like once i start thinking i just go on and on and on okay like i could sit here and talk about xenoblade for hours and hours and hours bruh and never get bored like oh, oh my god and xenoblade 3 is like a combination of one and two 
So they're taking everything I love from Xenoblade 1 and 2 and putting them all into one game? Like, as much as I shit on Xenoblade 1 and say how much better Xenoblade 2 is, because, you know, Xenoblade 2 is the better game, but you didn't hear that from me. As much shit as I give Xenoblade 1, I actually enjoy it a lot. I love Xenoblade 1 because obviously it's a Xenoblade game, so it's a given. But, you know, I just like Xenoblade 2 a bit more, okay? But I love Xenoblade 1 a lot. So don't get it twisted. I love Xenoblade 1, I just like 2 more because I started with 2, so... And I've put more time into 2, so I have a deeper connection with 2. I also just like the characters and story of 2 better. Probably because I played 2 first, but um... Yeah, so like everything I love from Xenoblade 1 and 2 are all into like one game. This is like Xenoblade 3 is like the embodiment of Xenoblade itself. Okay, like how is that not badass? Plus we have like all of the best girls in Xenoblade 3. We got Melia, best girl from Xenoblade 1. And we got Nia, best girl from Xenoblade 2 in Xenoblade 3. Okay, all we need is Lin and we're good. And yes, I said Lin. Okay, I know she's 13, and I'm not elaborating on shit, okay? Lynn is the best girl in Xenoblade 3, or Xenoblade X, don't ask me why. I'm saying this, but just go with it, okay? So, all the best girls in one game. We got Melly, we got Nia, and we got Mio. And, and, and Senna. Senna's over there too, a little bit. But... Just add Lin and we got the whole, we got the whole, we got the whole harem there, okay? We got all the best girls. Just throw Lin and Elma up in there? Easy. Maybe, maybe bring Cosmos back too, what? So, hey, I mean, hopefully Pyra and Mithra are in Xenoblade 3. I, I'd love, I would really love to see what they look like in Xenoblade 3. Now, I know everyone's saying how they want uh, Pithra to come back, like, oh, they want Pyra and Mithra and Xenoblade 3, but I really don't see a reason why they wouldn't return. I feel like if, Z if, uh, Pyra and Mithra were in Xenoblade 3, um, they'd be revealed as, like, as some huge, like, plot twist or a huge story beat. There'd be, like, a very cool and clever way to, like, reveal that, oh, Pyra and Mithra are in, you know, they're in Xenoblade 3. So, obviously, they're not gonna, like, um, you drop that information in a tweet or anything. I don't know. But at, at the rate they're going, Monopon is going to release the whole game <laughs> before June's even over. But I, I'm pretty, I'm, I think Pirate and Mithra are going to be back in Xenoblade 3. I really hope Alvis is there too, okay? When we go to Sword March at like the turning point in the game at the Makana Sword, when we make it up to the top of the Makana Sword, Alvis is just gonna be sitting up there chilling, sipping on his Zohar juice. <laughs> okay, but um, damn, I forgot what I was gonna say. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, I get so hype about Xenoblade Three. I just go on and on and on. Not even Xenoblade Three, but just Xenoblade in general. I just get to thinking, and I just go on and on and on. And then I get an idea off of what I was saying, and I just build off of that. And then I get another one, and just build off of that. And it's just, oh. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for Xenoblade 3, and the more excited I get, the more I want uh, July 29th to come around. The more I want July 29th to come around, the longer it takes. The longer it takes, the more impatient I get. The more impatient I get, the more tension builds. The more tension builds, the more anticipation builds. The more anticipation builds, the hyper I get. The hyper I get. Do you see? It's like a whole fucking cycle, okay? It's a whole cycle. And I hate it. Like, it's right there. We, have, we literally have like a month and a half left. We literally have like a month and three weeks left before Xenoblade 3 is like literally right fucking here. It's still like insane to think that Xenoblade 3 is even a real thing. Like, this is, it's, it's, it's actually real. Like, what? How? No. I don't want to believe it, but I want to believe it, okay? Like, ah! Well, hopefully, I don't know, this game is going to do absolutely incredible. Now, like, I already know this game is going to blow my mind because 
I don't ever go into games with like any expectations. I don't ever like play games with any expectations because a lot of people like to go into stuff with high expectations, very high expectations that are hard to meet, and then they get disappointed when those expectations aren't met, when those expectations are unreasonable in the first place. So like, not even that I don't have any expectations to avoid that, I just, I'm just like a very nonchalant and carefree person. I just don't really give a shit about anything, okay? So I'm not going into expect I'm not going into anything with expectations of anything. I don't expect shit. So my mind is always blown. I guess that's why it's so easy for me to like play new games and like fall in love with new games. Because whenever I play a new game, I'll like love it instantly. And like, I don't think there's ever been a game that I played where I was like, yeah, no, I don't like this. Like every game I've played, I've enjoyed. From what I remember, every game I've played, I've enjoyed because I don't have any expectations. So I'm always being surprised and engaged and drawn in and invested. So I know Xenoblade 3 is going to be absolutely wild. It's going to be a wild ride, this game, Xenoblade 3, okay? I know that meme's dead. But I had to bring it back. Um, shit, what was I even saying? Yeah, no, Xenoblade 3 is... Is, is, is something else, okay? Like, Xenoblade 2 was the first game to, like, ever hook me with its story. Most games I played, I, you know, I liked because of the gameplay itself, but I've never really like been one to like be really big and invested into the story and like games because of the characters or the story it tells. I've always just liked the gameplay and that really was that. But I don't know what it was, but for some reason Xenoblade 2 was different and it really like hooked me by its story. And by the end of the game, I almost wanted to cry. I've never cried at a game, like I'm not really emotional like games and movies and stuff like that not to sound like weird or desensitized but i just not easy for me to cry at games and stuff like that but xenoblade 2 that shit hit differently okay like i wanted to cry but i just couldn't okay it's like xenoblade 2 almost made me cry and no game has ever done that and i doubt will ever do that again Except for, you know, like maybe Xenoblade 3 or Xenosaga 3 when I get there. But I don't know what it is. But like Xenoblade is just really different. Xenoblade's story just really touched me. And it was like, <laughs> you know, like what? No game franchise or game by itself for that matter has ever made me feel the way Xenoblade f made me feel. So it's like, damn. Takahashi, you motherfucker, <laughs> okay? But but when Xenoblade 3 comes out, I would just be sitting there, just staring at the title screen, just still in disbelief at how real it's going to be, okay? I'm gonna be sitting there at like 11 p.m., all right? 11 p.m., July 28th, I'm gonna just be sitting there, staring at my Switch home screen, waiting for it to hit midnight, so... You know, Xenoblade 3 officially releases, I could immediately open it and just get straight into it. And I would just be ah, just in shock the entire fucking time. Like, you don't understand how, oh my god, how much this game means to me. Eventually, I'm going to make a video on, like, why Xenoblade, especially Xenoblade 2, more specifically, means so much to me and how it's changed my life. Because Xenoblade really has changed my life in my, like, worldview, my perspective on the world and, like, relationships with people in general. So, Xenoblade is fucking insane. Takahashi is one, is one madman, okay? He is a wild guy, okay? Yoko Taro had ass out here. <laughs> but, um, you know, Xenoblade 3 is going to be the best game ever like xenoblade 2 is my favorite game of all time right now but xenoblade 3 is easily going to trump that like as soon as it releases midnight xenoblade 3 is officially going to be my new favorite game i haven't played it we haven't seen shit about it yet but i already know that xenoblade 3 is going to 
fuck me up. Okay, Xenoblade 3. Oh, bro, Xenoblade 3. This game. Not only that, but it like mixes the combat of 1 and 2. And it's like the greatest thing ever. Okay, so like Xenoblade 3 is just a mix of everything I love in Xenoblade. Now, if they do some Xenoblade X stuff up in there, you know, give us some scales or whatever, give us some like Mira exploration type shit, then <laughs> absolute masterpiece. Xenoblade 3 is gonna be a masterpiece anyway, but like just the sheer anticipation and like hype and disbelief I have for Xenoblade 3 is not even funny, bro. Like, oh, I'm going to cry when this game comes out. Like, Oh my god, now it's like a better time to be a Xenoblade fan than ever before. Please, please, please go out and buy Xenoblade and support this game because I'm trying to get more Xenoblade games. Like what? And even off Xenoblade than some other Xeno IP. Like I want more Xeno. Fuck, maybe eventually Nintendo will stop being lame and go and buy the rights to Xenosaga and then we'll finally get Xenosaga 4, 5, and 6. Like, how does that not sound goaded? Like, I would buy the shit out of Xenosaga 4, 5, and 6. And then we can have like this giant, um, so you know, this is, you know, like, Trilogy is 3, Quadrilogy is 4. Five would be like pentilogy, and then six would be like sextilogy. <laughs> I don't know. Wait, it would be like a sextilogy. That sounds hella weird, but I would buy the shit out of the Xenosaka sextilogy, and even a Zeno Gear sextilogy. Like, <laughs> okay, but no, Xenosaga. Fuck, Zeno Blade three. I'm. I'm like, I'm playing through Xenosaga again, I continued Xenosaga, and y'all can see I've been, like, uploading a lot of episodes of that recently, so, like, my mind is just stuck on Xenosaga, but Xenoblade 3 is going to be, like, bro, July 29th, 2022 is going to go down as the absolute greatest day in all of history, the greatest day, the greatest day that has ever happened, and the greatest day that will ever happen, nothing will ever beat it. July 29th, 2022. Mark that down as like the best day ever in all of human history because oh, fuck. I'm getting so hype right now. Like when I get this hype and excited, my mind just goes everywhere and I start like just rambling incoherently. And it's just, can y'all not see how much this shit is fucking me up? Like I'm genuinely, I'm like genuinely, out of my mind about this game holy shit but um yeah that's <laughs> if i keep talking i would go on for hours it's already it's already been like 40 minutes i've just been like going on for like 40 minutes ranting about xenoblade 3 and how incredible this game would be i do way too much okay so but um yeah, that's gonna be it for the video because I don't want to make this like two hours long. If I keep talking, I won't stop. So I'm, I'm gonna force myself to stop here. But yeah, that's 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 it for this video. Y'all can see I'm still high. I'm like extremely high off the hype of this game. So, bro, just wait till the day it drops. Like I'm going to have an aneurysm. So catch me on the day it drops. I'm gonna have an aneurysm. Just wait till that day when you know. When you get that, you know, that notification. Y'all got notifications on for me? If you don't, turn them bitches on. Because, just wait till like 1 a.m. July 29th when you see, you know, part one to the Zero Blade 3 playthrough. I am going to be out of my fucking mind. Okay, so look, here I am going on talking again. I'm gonna shut the hell up. But yeah, that's it for this video. Go check out that video about Zero Blade 3 is the episode six go watch that because it's actually quite important so that's really that's really it so as always thanks for fucking watching be safe <laughs> be well <laughs> play some goddamn
Xenoblade! <laughs>